Namo tassa begoetto, arahetto, sama, sambudasa, Namo tassa begoetto, arahetto, sama, sambudasa, Namo tassa begoetto, arahetto, sama, sambudasa. So the, the Buddhist teaching, uh, the Dhamma, one of the characteristics of that is that it is uh, akaliko, which means timeless, outside of time or beyond time. And this is a word that has more than one level of meaning, but one of the meanings is that the teaching is useful and good and true in any period of time, whether it's ancient India or uh, the modern day and anything in between. It's not something that is specific, specifically true only for one historical context. So this, this we can bear in mind, but it's also, there's also another aspect to the Buddhist teaching in that it was given in a specific context, in a specific geographical, cultural, historical moment. And it's uh, useful for us to understanding the Buddhist teaching to be able to see it as it were through ancient Indian eyes and to put ourselves in the space of his contemporary uh, students and, and audience. This can be difficult for us. We live in a quite different time and place. And some of the misunderstandings that uh, arise about the Buddhist teaching, I think, comes from the tendency of moderns to anachronistically put their ideas and values and assumptions back into the ancient context. So they miss some of the nuances of the teaching. You can find in the suttas, when you read a, a sutta, that very often, particularly in the Digga and Majima, you'll see very often that there'll be a framing paragraph at the beginning telling us who the Buddha's audience was, whether it was lay people or monks, and whether it was a large crowd or a small group, and what city it was in, or so forth. And this can often help us to understand the, the teaching, the specific teaching, because the Buddha did pitch his discourses to the specific audience very skillfully. So in this uh, talk, I would like to explore a little bit of the background of India at the Buddhist time, so we can begin to fit the Buddhist teaching into that picture. India has always been, from the beginning even down to the present day, it's been a very diverse cultural area with many ethnic groups, many languages, uh, many religions, and this was true in the 5th century BC, and it's true in the 21st century AD. If we go back to the Buddhist time, and let's first of all specify what that is. Traditionally, the Buddhist calendar is dated from the Parinibbana, or the passing away of the Buddha, at 543 BC as year one. But modern scholarship has determined that that date is uh, at least 80 years too early. And the Buddha probably actually died sometime around 400 BC, which would put his birth at about 480. So he lived for those 80 years, roughly the 5th century BC. And the India of his time 
was a dynamic mix of influences. If we go back prior to the Buddha, we can see at least three roots that went into the shaping of the culture of northern India. Roughly the Ganges Valley is the area we're concerned with. The three roots would be the Harappan culture, the indigenous Dravidians of the Ganges, and the incoming Aryan tribes. Around um, 3000 BC on, onwards for the next thousand years or so, there was a very urbanized and in some ways quite advanced civilization in the northwest of the area we're concerned with in the Indus Valley region that's called by modern uh, archaeologists the Harappan culture after one of the great sites. These people had an agricultural civilization. The Indus Valley at that time was much more fertile and productive than it became later. It was so, has somewhat dried out since then, but at the time it was very rich rich enough to provide enough agricultural surplus to support large cities. And these, we don't know a lot about these people and their culture because no one has been able to decipher their writing. But they uh, did live in large, very well organized cities that were laid out in quite uh, rigid grid patterns, which indicates a high degree of central planning. They didn't grow up haphazardly. And they had, much earlier than anyone else, they had water systems to have running water and sewerage in the homes. And they seem to have been, from the archaeological evidence, they seem to have been a fairly egalitarian culture. There's not a great deal of difference in size between the largest and the smallest dwellings. So that would indicate a quite flat social hierarchy. And they were in decline for some time. We think that it may have been ecological collapse, which happened to many early cultures, that they overtaxed their environmental base and they probably over farmed and were no longer able to support them their high population and the cities began to decline and at that time beginning uh, roughly around 1500 BC the uh, second big uh, influence on India came in which were the Aryans they were tribes of people from somewhere in Central Asia or probably around the um, Caspian Sea area uh, perhaps in modern Pakistan. Uh, we don't really know for sure where they originated. One of their branches, the Iranian branch, in their uh, Zoroastrian scriptures, they recount the movement of the Aryans from the far north. And they were, according to these scriptures, they were impelled to move by climate change, by the climate getting a lot colder, and this forced them south. In any case, they had early developed some technologies that gave them a significant military advantage over everybody else at the time, uh, namely uh, early domestication of the horse and the use of metal weapons, first bronze and then later iron. And using these advantages, they spread quite widely over Eurasia into Europe and uh, south into uh, Iran and India. All the languages that uh, we call Indo-European spring from this root. So that's most of the European languages as well as Iranian and many of the Indian languages like Hindi and Bengali. The group that penetrated into India first 
overran what was left of the Harappan culture, which was already in decline. And at that time, these uh, Aryans were at a cultural level that was quite um, barbaric, roughly the equivalent of like the Homeric age in Greece, the heroic age. Heroic meaning that they were very warlike and um, they would fight amongst themselves as well as against the uh, preceding cultures in India. Culturally, they, they were divided already as they first appeared in India. They were already divided into three uh, castes or Varna, the warrior caste, the priestly caste, and the cattle herders. And their economy was, like many nomadic peoples, was dependent on uh, domestic animals. They had horses and cattle. That was their source of wealth and of uh, their economy. Religiously, they worshipped a pantheon of gods headed by Indra, the um, chief of their gods, a sky god. And this uh, early uh, pantheon that appears in the Vedas is uh, visible in... Uh, many other of the descendant cultures from, from that initial Aryan expansion, such as the Greek pantheon, the Norse pantheon, and uh, we have uh, a version of it in Buddhism in the, uh, the gods of Tawatinsa heaven, which seem to be very much modeled on that early Vedic pantheon. The Vedas were their oral scriptures, and they seem to have had those um, scriptures very early on in oral form, and it was the Brahmin caste who uh, maintained the tradition, remembered the scriptures. The Vedas give us our information about the early gods, which are not the same gods that were prominent in later Hinduism. This is something definitely not to get mixed up. Shiva doesn't appear at all in the Vedas. Vishnu is a relatively minor figure. And uh, Brahma doesn't really appear under that name either. Indra was the chief god, and probably the second most important god was Agni, the god of fire. And we see the fire worship is a common theme of um, early Aryan religion. It occurs in the Vedas and Zoroastrianism in Iran also has a very strong core of uh, fire ritual. And we see uh, even in, um, in Europe with the Romans and the sacred fires that they would keep burning tended in the home and also in the city by the Vestals. So the sky god and the fire god, they had uh, also a, a pantheon of other gods, and the number of 33 does come up, which is also the number of the gods in Tawatinsa heaven in the Buddhist uh, iteration. So after they conquered through the um, Indus Valley, they moved on expanding into the Ganges. And here they met a different, uh, a different cultural base, and this is the third, it's actually the oldest uh, Indian um, cultural group. Uh, it's the third that I'm mentioning, is the indigenous Dravidian people of the Ganges Valley. And at the time they were quite primitive, they were in a kind of a Neolithic stage of, of civilization. And the Aryans' advance down the Ganges was slow because of the terrain. The whole area was uh, thickly covered in jungle at the time, so it was a slow going for them. And they made much use of fire, which was uh, has been considered 
uh, perhaps one of the reasons Agni, the fire god, was so important in the early days. But they eventually conquered the whole of the, the Ganges Valley. They didn't fully displace the indigenous inhabitants, but they incorporated them into their civilization by adding them as a fourth and lowest caste, the, the Sudhas, uh, the laboring caste, and the Vasas, the, uh, who were the cattle herders, evolved into being the merchant class as the Aryans settled down and settled into uh, an agricultural and uh, urbanized civilization and matured beyond their barbaric phase. Their political arrangement in, in the early times seems to have been in the form of republics and when we say republics, we should be very careful not to impose modern ideas of what it means to have a republic. They certainly were not democratic in any way. Um, they were uh, assemblies of the heads of clans. So it was more like an aristocratic republic. There was, by the time of the Buddha, when we get to that 5th century before Christ, there was a decided, there had already been a decided movement away from the Republican form of government. A few republics still survived. The Buddha himself was born into one in the north of this cultural area, on the actual fringe of it, uh, the Sakyan Republic, which was probably being out in the backwoods, uh, the boonies of the culture area was probably quite old-fashioned and still preserved more of the old traditions of the Aryan republics. But elsewhere in the Ganges Valley, we have the arising of monarchies, kingdoms, and traditionally there were considered to be 16 of them. So they would have been quite small geographically. And like a lot of... Uh, early kingdoms around the world, the sense of the king ruling was more rule over people than of a geography. It was considered that power radiated from the, the center and uh, those who were subject to the king, they, they, they were in his area, they paid taxes to the, the central monarchy. The two most powerful monarchies in India at that time were Magadha and Kosala, both of which the Buddha spent extensive amount of time in and became close to the, the kings of those, those kingdoms. The king would rule the Raja, is the, the king, he was considered to be the head of the Kshatriya class, and uh, he would always rule together with a Purohita, a, a Brahmin, the head of the Brahmin caste, as his prime minister or vizier. The title was Purohita, and that was always taken from the Brahmins. So the actual rule was a kind of a dual rulership of the two highest castes. The, the two supreme castes were the warriors and the priests. The rest of society was a uh, divided into various um, occupational groups, but we didn't yet have the extreme subdivisions of the caste system as it uh, evolved later in India. It was still very much just the broad categories of warriors, priests, merchants, and laborers. There were also the outcasts who were uh, those who uh, performed occupations that were considered unclean, like uh, leather work or uh, refuse removal, they were the outcasts or chandalas, as they were called in the in the Pali. Uh, 
at the very bottom. They were considered outside of the caste system altogether. So we can see here also with the um, exclusion of the Chandalas, one of the cultural hallmarks of India from right from the Harappan times was a emphasis put on personal and social cleanliness and hygiene. So the only way they could maintain a ritual purity and still get the dirty jobs done was to exclude the people who did those jobs from a respectable society. So it was not definitely not an egalitarian society. It was a hierarchical, very structured society. Everyone had their place and their uh, functions. We can see a example of this in his ideal form in the Sagala Sutta, where the Buddha is talking to a lay person about the best way to conduct one's life in, uh, in society. And uh, he meets this lay person who is doing a ritual worshipping the six directions. And the Buddha tells him, uh, I will teach you how we do the, how we worship the six directions in the discipline of the Buddha. And he identifies the six directions with six social relationships. He has this man representing an arbitrary center, and there's a kind of social mandala of relationships. He has those who are above him, those who are beside him, and those who are beneath him. He has relationships with his friends, with his wife and children, with his uh, workmen and servants, with the um, holy men and uh, Brahmins, and so forth. And in each type of relationship, there is a reciprocal exchange of the performance of duties. And this was an important social concept that the harmony of the society was preserved when everybody performs their duties. And the duties are reciprocal, they're symmetrical. They're not identical both ways. The duties of a master to a servant, for example, is to look after them and make sure they have enough to eat and not to overwork them and to give them time off when uh, it's possible to do so. And the duties of the servant is to serve the master well, to perform their, their work skillfully, and so forth. So, and if both parties perform their duties, then there's harmony. And the Buddha presents this as, quote, as an ideal. So there's no exploitation or abuse from either side, but nor is there any assumption of equality or of a person having right, a right to um, the receiving of these uh, things. It's a sense of the other party has the duty to provide them. The um, technological level of India at the time was uh, beginning to enter a new phase. It was, as I said, agricultural civilization. They had rice cultivation and also uh, in, in the western area was more uh, rice and uh, then rather than rice, it was like wheat and barley. So they had, uh, with rice, you require irrigation and you require some organization. And that was, uh, so that was happening. They, they had uh, cities, urbanized centers. They had uh, metalwork, although iron at the time was still relatively rare and was used more for uh, weaponry rather than for practical purposes. There were two technological advances that were 
fairly new at by the time of the Buddha, and they were making a big impact on society. One was money. The use of a currency is something that has a very profound effect on a civilization when it first begins to use it and replaces barter, because it opens up the economy, and it also makes trade more uh, lucrative and um, productive. Uh, both internal trade and external trade. And there was beginning some contact with and trade with other cultures, such as uh, Mesopotamia and uh, Southeast Asia, which was called Sawanabumi, and also with the Greek world. These were all in a very beginning phase at the time of the Buddha. It seems that... Um, India did not have a lot of seaborne commerce at the time, but that was the beginning of it. We see in the Jataka stories, there's sometimes stories of merchants going to sea, but you do get the feeling from these stories that it wasn't, uh, it was a very perilous adventure because most of these stories in the Jatakas, the sea voyages end in shipwreck. So there is a hint in. Uh, at least the one passage in the Diga Nikaya that the Buddha knew of the existence of the Greek civilization because when he's criticizing the Brahmins who held that the caste system was divinely inspired, the Buddha was uh, maintaining it was a human invention. It was just a social convention. It didn't have an ultimate reality. He said, uh, consider the Yonas, meaning the Greeks. Yona is the Indian um, meaning of, uh, or the Indian corruption of the word uh, Ionian. And so they call the Greeks Yonas. He says, consider the Yonas. They do not have a caste system like us. They only recognize two classes, free and slave. So uh, the caste system was not a primordial, it wasn't laid down by God. It was a uh, human convention for purely practical purposes of dividing people by occupation. So we have mentioned uh, often in the suttas and, and more so in the Vinaya of uh, various uh, amounts of money in kahapanas and maha kahapanas. Uh, this was the, the currency of the time. And this would allow a more sophisticated economy and the development of uh, trading networks. The other technology that was of significant impact, although this really didn't have a big impact at the Buddhist time, it, it was a bit later, was writing which was probably first beginning in India around this time of the Buddha's life. The Buddha's scriptures were not written down. No scriptures were written down at first. It seems like the first use of writing in India was for purely mundane purposes, such as the merchants keeping accounts or the kings sending um, diplomatic messages back and forth. It was probably even considered uh, profane to commit holy texts to, to writing. They were preserved orally by memorization. And this was actually a very reliable means of transmission and preservation of the scriptures because the method used was chanting in groups. So you would have a large group of monks who would um, learn by heart one of the Nikayas. And this is one of the reasons the Sutta Pitaka is divided into Nikayas, which means something like a, an assembly or a college. There would be a group of monks that learnt the Digha Nikaya by heart, for example, and part of their duties every day was to chant one of the suttas from the Digha all together as a group. And that would be self-correcting, because if anybody made a mistake, all the rest in the group would uh, 
be able to correct that. So the suttas were preserved in that way for the first several hundred years. Religiously at the Buddhist time, the Brahmanic religion was still the, uh, the predominant or the establishment religion. And we should uh, distinguish this uh, Brahmanism, as it's generally called by modern scholars, from Hinduism. Hinduism, as we know it later, was a later development of the, um, of the various roots of Indian thought. At the time of the Buddha, for example, um, the non-Vedic deities like Shiva were not important, uh, if they were known at all. The Brahmins held the Vedas as their scriptures, and the Vedas were considered very sacred. It was actually a belief that the Vedas predated the universe, that uh, the supreme uh, God first created the Vedas, and then he created the universe as a vehicle for the Vedas to be expressed. The practice of the Vedic religion was very uh, ritualistic. The Brahmins would perform sacrifices. And in very early times, there were probably human sacrifices. There are some hints of that, but that didn't exist by the Buddhist time, but there were still animal sacrifices. And they were performed in a very minutely governed ritualistic manner with certain gestures and accoutrements and chanting. And it was a belief that uh, if the, the sacrifice was performed exactly correctly, then the gods were compelled to perform their, their half of the bargain. So a lay person would um, hire Brahmins to perform a ritual, say, for fertility of their field or for the health of their son or, you know, some some worldly um, desire to be fulfilled. And the Brahmins would have a specific ritual and a specific sacrifice to perform for that. And if the fellow didn't get what he wanted from the gods, that all that meant was the Brahmins had made some mistake in, either in the chanting or the gestures. There, it wasn't perfect and we better try it again. That was the establishment religion, and the Buddha was very critical of the animal sacrifices and, and always spoke against them you know, for the destruction of living beings. But that wasn't the whole of the religious life of ancient India. One of the, one of the really uh, unique characteristics of Indian civilization uh, was its a uh, very broad tolerance of uh, different religions and philosophies. There was no attempt to impose an orthodoxy by force. So there were quite a wide range of non-Brahmanical religious groups. And we see in the suttas often the phrase uh, referring to uh, holy men as Samanas and Brahmins. And the Brahmins we've spoken of, the Samanas were men, and in some cases women, but mostly men, who would go off into the forest to seek a higher states of consciousness. Mostly by what they call tapas, which is self-mortification various uh, kinds of extreme fasting and, and uh, exposure to extreme heat or uh, holding uncomfortable postures for long periods of time. And the Buddha himself, before he became the Buddha, the Bodhisattva went through six years of experimenting with these kind of practices before he gave them up as, as fruitless. But it was a, a widespread movement in, in India. And these people were called samanas, and that's a word that's cognate with the, the word shaman, 
as we have in many cultures around the world, uh, shamans or a, a specific class of priestly individuals who go into trances or communicate with the spirits or gods. The Samana movement probably originated not with the Aryan newcomers, but with the primordial culture of, of India in the indigenous Dravidian tribes of, of the north. So the religious life of the time was a mixture of these, these different early groups that uh, were merging and blending by this time into one civilization. The Buddhist order of monks, the, the Sangha, actually has some characteristics both of Brahmins and of Samanas. The, the uh, bhikkhus are often called Samanas, and, and uh, the Buddha himself was sometimes referred to as Mahasamana, the great Samana. And we still to this day call a, a novice uh, a Samanera, that's the Pali for a, a novice, is little Samana. But with the Vinaya and the discipline of the orderliness of the monks does have some characteristics of, of the Brahmins. And in Buddhist countries like Sri Lanka and uh, Thailand, the bhikkhus take up some of the role of the Brahmins as a, as a priestly group. And although it was never part of the original uh, intention of the establishment of the Sangha, the, the, the bhikkhus will perform to some degree some, some rituals, of course not sacrifices, but chanting of uh, paritas and so on at auspicious occasions. So the Buddha operated in this environment of ancient India. And one of the things we note about the Buddha's career, of his teaching career, is that he was free to move about the whole length and breadth of uh, that culture zone, that, which is called in the, in the Pali text, it's called the middle country, Majima Padesa. Uh, which refers to the Ganges Valley in northern India. And uh, he preached to all classes of societies, from the Chandalas, the outcasts, all the way up to the, the kings, and was respected and um, supported everywhere he went. So this was a very fortunate moment for the Buddha to come into the world, a fortunate time and place, some place that would not only tolerate but honor and revere uh, a teacher of a, a new way of life, a new teaching, a new religion or philosophy. We can compare that to the experience of Jesus Christ born into the Roman Empire and his teaching career was cut short after three years and they executed him. That's unthinkable that such a thing would happen in India to a, a holy teacher. The Buddha in his previous life, before he, he was born as, the, as, the, as Siddhartha Gautama, was spent in uh, Tusita heaven. And it said that before he came down, and by that time he had completed all the Bharamis, and he was just waiting to take birth and attain Buddhahood in the human realm. And it said before he took birth, he examined the conditions, the time and the place for the suitability of the arising of a Buddha. So the arising of the Buddha in this uh, account w at that time was not accidental. It was an ideal time for the arising of a Buddha. It was a society that was uh, supportive of the teachings and a society advanced enough to have a, a culture and a, a civilization that would be receptive to the teachings. <laughs> 
So this is a brief uh, introduction to the uh, the conditions of India at the time of the Buddha. And uh, in subsequent talks, I would like to explore the later developments, the establishment of the Sasana and the later developments in the Buddhist teaching. But uh, for this time, I wanted to establish the background and the basis for the time and place of the Buddha.